The next item of business is portfolio questions. First question, Jenny Gilruth, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer, to ask the Scottish Government how its cross-portfolio working on tackling adverse childhood experiences is contributing to closing the attainment gap. And I remind members and the PLO to the Education Secretary. Cabinet Secretary. Officer, the Scottish Government recognises the negative impact of adverse childhood experiences on the well-being of children, which in turn has a direct impact on their attainment. The Scottish Attainment Challenge has a specific focus on health and well-being alongside literacy and numeracy. Using funding from the £750 million Attainment Scotland Fund, schools are delivering a variety of health and wellbeing interventions to support their pupils, including those who have been impacted by adverse childhood experiences. In addition, I hosted an event in March, along with the First Minister and other ministerial colleagues, to hear from people working across sectors about the actions needed to drive progress on ACES. We have published a report on what we heard, and I have committed to build on this important dialogue. Jenny Gilruth. Thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. Research published by the EIS last month detailed the impact of poverty on Scottish education. Children unable to afford school trips, children coming to school hungry, children arriving at school in dirty clothes. Can the Cabinet Secretary confirm if he plans to address the impact of adverse childhood experiences with his UK counterpart? And does he agree with me that the Tories' ideological obsession with austerity... No, is okay, you've had your question. Children? Sorry, we've got short of time. Cabinet Secretary. <laughs> President Officer, uh, undoubtedly the impact of austerity is having an effect on the, uh, the backgrounds and the circumstances of young people and the government takes a number of measures to try to address that through the various interventions that we make, spending over £100 million a year mitigating the effects of, of austerity. Um, in the uh, Tackling Child Poverty Delivery Plan, we set out a range of different measures across government to try to tackle these issues. And through the use of the Attainment Challenge funding, some of the issues that Jenny Garuth raised in her question, substantial issues where young people may miss out on opportunities, can be alleviated by the utilisation of Scottish Attainment Challenge funding. I'd also point out that the Government recently um, made, uh, reached an agreement with the Convention of Scottish Local Authorities to establish a minimum uh, school clothing grant of a minimum of £100, which will be a significant benefit to the overwhelming majority of young people in Scottish schools. And I um, uh, appreciate the agreement we've reached with local government to take that step to assist in tackling the issues raised by Ms Gorruth. Thank you, Liam McArthur. Thank you very much. The Cabinet Secretary referred to the engagement with COSLA. Obviously, the local authorities are key in terms of the delivery uh, of the aspirations uh, that he's set out. Can you maybe outline the, the work that's been done with COSLA and the process for managing that ongoing engagement going forward? Cabinet Secretary. Well, obviously, we have regular discussions with the Convention of Scottish Local Authorities at individual portfolio level, and I, I saw the COSLA Education Sports person just yesterday. But as a, a, a team of ministers, we met last week with the leadership of COSLA, the president, vice president, and political group leader, leaders across the, um, uh, the political spectrum, including uh, the leader of Orkney Islands Council, who was there on behalf of the independent group, to focus on how our combined efforts can support the same policy direction. And indeed, we had a very good example of that on Monday with the launch of the National Performance Framework, which has been um, endorsed by the Convention of Scottish Local Authorities. Indeed, they've been active involved in the preparation of that, as have members of Parliament across the spectrum, to try to ensure that we overcome any um, effects of compartmentalisation within government policy making, because the, 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 there is a need for cross-portfolio work to address the issues raised by adverse childhood experiences, and we will only address those questions if we work across boundaries. Question two, Jeremy Balfour. To ask the Scottish Government what support it gives to school leavers regarding the transition to further education, training and work. Minister. There is a broad range of support available to school leavers, including careers advice offered by Skills Development Scotland to help pupils move into further education, training, and work. SDS also works closely with pastoral care staff in schools to identify those leavers who are less likely to engage with mainstream opportunities, opportunities and together with local partners offer targeted transitional support to this vulnerable group. Jeremy Balfour. Can I thank the Minister for his answer, but a survey commissioned by the Education and Skills Committee last week found that just 3% of school leavers were told more about how to get onto a training programme than other post-school options whereas 60% of school leavers were told more about how to get into university than other options. What action is the 
Minister and the Scottish Government taken to ensure that all school leavers receive adequate information and advice about transitioning into non-university routes, such as apprenticeships? Briefly, please, Minister. I mean, briefly, Minister. I meant briefly, Mr Balfour. Thank you, Minister. Uh, Presiding Officer. Uh, I'll still try to be brief nonetheless. Uh, well, that's exactly why we're taking forward our Developing Young Workforce uh, Programme, uh, President Officer. I, I actually recognise and understand the points that uh, Mr Balfour making. It is a, a, a historic uh, challenge for us. One of the big challenges we have before us is to ensure that there's parity of esteem across all uh, uh, options for young people. So that's work we're committed to, taking forward through Developing Young Workforce. I've seen that beginning to make a difference. I'm going to take it further still with the recommendations out of the Learner Journey Review. Joanne Lamont. Thank you. Um, I wonder if the Minister could outline what advice is given to young people who go straight from school to work and may end up in an exploitative, um, insecure work. What advice is given about what's reasonable for them to expect in terms of contracts and what advice is given about the role of trade unions in protecting young people from the more exploitative practices Minister. they're experiencing? Well, of course, advice about the, the world of work will be uh, provided through uh, uh, the careers advice that is available in every single uh, school environment. Uh, the uh, issue about what young people might expect out of the world of work is one that we do need to uh, reflect on. We probably can do better in terms of ensuring that we know what they expect out of uh, the world of work and ensure that we can uh, work towards that. And indeed, that was something that we were just discussing uh, yesterday at the Strategic Labour Market Group, which uh, I chair. Question three, Finlay Carson. What support it provides for the funding of further education courses in Dumfries and Galloway? Minister. In the academic year 2018-19, the Scottish Government, through the Funding Council, will provide a real terms increase of over 8% to support the teaching of further and higher education courses at Dumfries and Galloway College, totalling £9.73 million. Additionally, we will provide £1.78 million in student support as part of the, initial, uh, the college's initial allocation. Finley Carson. Thank the Minister for that response. At a recent consultation carried out with the South of Scotland Economic Partnership, the Chairman mentioned that a very good funding application had been submitted from the South of Scotland colleges. Can you suggest why they've had to do this? Is that not the role of the Scottish Funding Council? Minister. The colleges in the area have actually to be commended, I would suggest, for the innovative work that they are taking forward uh, together and in partnership and taking full advantage um, of the, the new um, opportunities that they have in the south of Scotland because of the work that is, is going on there, not just within um, education, but also in skills and general economic recovery. I really do look forward to hearing more about the college's suggestions that they're taking forward to the south of Scotland Economic Partnership and would encourage the colleges to continue with that work. Question four, Jackie Bailey. The Scottish Government, how it ensures that educational campuses have appropriate and adequate levels of accessibility for disabled students. Cabinet Secretary. Presiding officer, in Scotland we have a range of legislation and guidance in place to ensure adequate levels of accessibility for disabled students. Responsible bodies, including education authorities, independent and grant-aided schools, are required to develop and publish accessibility strategies to improve over time access to the curriculum, the physical environment and school information for pupils with disabilities. Jackie Bailey. Retrieve for that response. I have a young woman who attends the CPG on muscular dystrophy um, who is currently applying for university. She's very bright. Her choices should be completely unlimited. Um, however, due to her being in a wheelchair, um, her choices are limited by the accessibility of canvases. So what action will the government um, take to improve and inform disabled students about accessibility, particularly in higher education institutions in Scotland? Cabinet Secretary. I'm concerned to hear the detail that Jackie Bailey recounts, and if she'd like to write to me and the Minister, we'll look very directly into that case, um, because there are separate um, supports in place, either through the Student Awards Agency or through the Scottish Funding Council, where the specific funding allocated to try to address some of these issues in a very practical way, because there will be individual students who will present for particular courses where there may be challenges in the existing physical estate or in other issues where resources should be applied to try to ensure there are no barriers to their learning. So um, we, we, uh, I, I think there are measures in place to try to address the scenario Jackie Bailey paints, but if she would like to write to me the details, we'll look into that and see what we can do to address that. Question five, George Adam. 
Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government how it encourages engagement between universities and secretary, secondary education establishments. Minister. We expect schools and other partners to work collaboratively with each other, and there are many examples of schools doing this effectively with universities, colleges, employers and others to the clear benefit of their young people. In response to the recommendations from the Commission on Widening Access, the Scottish Funding, Funding Council is currently developing a new school engagement framework to provide more targeted and enhanced engagement with schools. We also invest £2.5 million each year through the Scottish Funding Council to support the access to higher demand professions and the schools for higher education programmes. George Adam. I thank the Minister for her answer. Does the Minister agree with me that UWS, based in Paisley, is leading the way on this issue and that other universities should try ways to work with this institution to try and mirror their many successes? Minister. Well, I would very much commend the, the work that the University of the West of Scotland do in this and other areas around widening access. Uh, but it is, as I've stressed in the Chamber before, imperative that all universities play their role in achieving our widening access ambitions because only through working together through the schools, the colleges, the universities, the funding council and uh, the government uh, can we achieve the widening access targets and ambitions uh, that we all share. And I would commend and encourage um, University of the West of Scotland to carry on in their great work and I'm sure uh, they are um, um, a great source of uh, good practice that other universities can follow. Colin Smith. Thank you, President Officer. The Minister will be aware that, that one of the innovative ways in which universities and other further education establishments interact with the secondary sector is the, the innovative Dumfries Learning Town project. Now, after the summer, pupils will move out of existing Langland School, Lockside Primary School, and my own former schools, St Ninian's Primary and Maxwell High School, into their new Northwest Dumfries campus. Will the Minister join with me in paying tribute to the enormous contribution those four schools made over the past few decades to the community in particular? of North West Dumfries and wish all the pupils and staff Thank well you. Thank as they you. embark on their new life in the Thank new campus. Thank you, Minister. Well, I would indeed um, wish them well in their, their new endeavours on the new campus. I believe the Deputy First Minister uh, will be visiting them in due course, and uh, I know he's looking forward to the visit. Question six, Fulton McGregor. Thank you, Ask the Scottish Government what feedback it has had from head teachers regarding the Pupil Equity Fund. Cabinet Secretary. So the Scottish Government regularly engages with head teachers and head teacher representatives about pupil equity funding. Um, for example, the Association of Head Teachers and Deputies in Scotland fed into the development of the National Operational Guidance published to support head teachers on pupil equity funding. Um, and the attainment advisors who are appointed to take forward the, uh, the wider work on attainment are in regular dialogue with head teachers on the Scottish Attainment Challenge and on pupil equity funding. Fulton McGregor. Thank you. The Minister will be aware of the continued attempts by the Labour and Tory administration in North Lanarkshire to raid the Pupil Equity Fund last year for classroom assistance and this year for swimming lessons. Does the Minister agree with me that it is important that head teachers are allowed to choose how they spend the money to lower the attainment gap rather than being pressured into giving up some of this very welcome funding to pay for services pre previously supplied as part of the overall education budgets for councils? Cabinet Secretary. It, the guidance is very clear that uh, pupil equity funding cannot be used to provide for um, essentially replacement of services that had been uh, provided by local authorities in the immediate period before decisions were being made. Um, and I've taken action in relation to this question um, on one occasion before, and my officials monitor this situation very carefully. Uh, obviously, it's important. And from what I find, uh, feed, feedback that reaches me around the, the education system, that head teachers um, are welcoming the opportunity to exercise greater discretion through pupil equity funding and to be able to meet the needs of the young people uh, who they are trying to support. And I encourage head teachers to continue in their efforts to utilise those resources effectively to help us in our national effort to close the poverty related attainment gap. Liz Smith. Uh, thank you. Uh, the Cabinet Secretary is well aware that I think there are very positive signs uh, about pupil equity funding and that the Education Committee has received uh, quite a lot of good evidence on this respect. It's also received evidence, however, that there has been some confusion about whether schools are able to spend that money on teachers. Could the Cabinet Secretary, just for the avoidance of any doubt, confirm to the Parliament that schools are able to use that pupil equity funding to take on additional teachers? Cabinet Secretary. I'm, I'm very happy to confirm to Parliament that um, 
uh, pupil equity funding can be used to take on teachers. Um, I would encourage it if that's appropriate for head teachers to take that decision. And as I think I said in the last portfolio question time, and may also have said at the Education Committee, the recruitment, the pupil equity funding is already supporting a number of teachers, if my memory serves me right. Um, something like 500 out of the 600 increase in teachers in the last 12 months was paid for by pupil equity funding. And if I could go one stage further than that, one of the issues that were raised with me by the Education Committee was about the longevity of contracts. Um, the government has given an absolute commitment that there will be £120 million of pupil equity funding in each financial year until the end of this parliament. That should therefore enable any school to be able to take on a member of staff over a longer period of time than just a 12-month period, because I've heard some evidence of 12-month contracts being offered, and I give that commitment in Parliament today that that funding will be there till the end of this Parliament, which I hope will encourage uh, longer-term contracts to be offered to members of staff. Tavis Scott. Uh, thank you, President, and I welcome that last point. But, but you will also the Cabinet Secretary will also recognise that uh, PEF funding is based on free school meals. And in some areas of Scotland, particularly rural and isolated areas, the eligibility for free school meals can be difficult because of the stigma that's attached to that particular mechanism. I know the Cabinet Secretary is aware of that. Can you say to Parliament how he plans to address that particular point? Cabinet Secretary. Could, could I, could I respond in two ways to Mr Scott? The first is to say that whilst the level of free school meal entitlement may vary from year to year in an individual school, and that may result in a difference in pupil equity funding. I have applied some constraints to the degree of variability that could be applied, because I recognise that if long-term commitments of the type I'm encouraging people to make in my answer to Liz Smith, schools need to know they're not going to be varying that much from year to year. And if my memory says me right, I think the tolerance level was 5% of a difference. Um, if that's incorrect, I'll confirm that to, to Mr Scott in writing. The second point is about eligibility for free school meals, and I accept that free school, well, I accept that free school meals is a more finely grained measure than the Scottish Index of Multiple Deprivation to detect the existence of poverty, but it's not perfect. And uh, last week, I had a discussion with the Scottish Borders Council about some work that they're undertaking to look at a whole variety of different elements of information that could provide a more finely grained measure. And my, the statisticians on behalf of the Scottish Government are going to engage with the Scottish Borders Council on that mechanism because I am open to alternative mechanisms. It's just that so far we haven't been able to amass a mechanism that gives us a better mechanism and a more reliable mechanism statistically than free school meal entitlement. But I accept the point that Mr Scott makes that in rural areas, sometimes people are reluctant to apply for free school meals because of the danger of stigma. Ian Gray, can I ask you to be brief, please? The Education Committee also heard uh, evidence uh, of head teachers, and I think two local authorities uh, have used pupil equity funding to employ campus police officers. Uh, I wonder if the Education Secretary feels that's an appropriate use. Cabinet Secretary. Um, if, if a head teacher believes that the most appropriate intervention they should make is to um, take the steps to recruit a campus police officer. I don't think I'm in a position to question their judgment on that matter, with one caveat, and it's this, and it's my point uh, which I made, uh, I think, to Mr. M Mr. McGregor in my answer to, to him, that if a campus police officer was employed last year by a local authority and is not being employed this year, that is not possible because that would be a replacement for a service previously provided and funded by the local authority. But in principle, if a head teacher believes that's the right step to take, then I would accept the judgment of the head teacher on that question. Thank you. Question seven, Stuart McMillan. Thank you, Presiding Officer, to ask the Scottish Government what action it's taking in schools to address sectarianism. Cabinet Secretary. Presiding Officer, sectarianism must be challenged wherever it occurs, and this government has delivered an unprecedented range of activities to tackle the issue across Scotland. Since 2012, we've invested £13.5 million to support 108 organisations deliver work to tackle sectarianism. This has included a wide range of educational activities, including developing Scotland's first national resource on tackling sectarianism and delivering free CPD training sessions 
through sense over sectarianism to support teachers deliver anti-sectarian education. Our investment supported the development of the Nil by Mouth Champions for Change school programme and I was pleased to learn that is now available in all 32 local authority areas. Stuart McMillan. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that reply and the Cabinet Secretary may know that uh, last week I hosted an event involving two schools in my constituency, St Columbus High School from Gourock and also Clydeview Academy, uh, who are jointly working on an anti-sectarian project working with Nil by, now, Nil by Mouth. Does the Cabinet Secretary consider that the existing collaborative projects involving schools could be worked upon and has the Cabinet Secretary also uh, given any consideration to making similar projects mandatory Thank where you. it's considered there could be a beneficial effect for local communities. Thank you. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, first of all, can I just make reference to the fact that in relation to the events that Mr McMillan referred to, we had two pupils from St Columbus High School delivering time for reflection yesterday and it was a pleasure. Uh, to see such fine young people contributing to our parliamentary proceedings yesterday. I think these are very welcome initiatives that have been taken forward with nil by mouth. Um, I encourage, and as I said in my original answer, I'm very pleased that 32 local authorities are now taking forward work with nil by mouth. I think it is appropriate to be deployed in all parts of the country. As to whether it should be mandatory is a different question. I think it's up to individual schools to decide what uh, steps they should take to tackle the issue of, sect, uh, of, of, of addressing sectarianism as it presents itself and the issue will be of greater or lesser significance in different parts of the country. Uh, but I think what's important is that we make the materials and the approaches available to ensure that th those options are available to schools to take forward. Thank you. Question 8, Christina McKelvey. Uh, thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on its progress in eliminating prejudice-based bullying in schools. Cabinet Secretary. Officer, on the 28th of May, the Scottish Government published supplementary guidance for schools and local authorities on recording and monitoring of bullying incidents in schools. The purpose of this guidance is to develop a consistent and uniform approach to recording and monitoring. To complement the guidance, we are working with CMIS, the school's information management system, to update the current bullying and equalities module to enable improved recording and monitoring of prejudice-based bullying in schools. Christina McKelvey. Uh, thank you, uh, President Officer. I, I welcome all of those advances in the work that the, the government has undertaken. Last week, the Cabinet Secretary visited St John Ogilvy High School in my constituency to see the pupil-led work in establishment and establishing and implementing their new school anti-bullying policy. Will the, will the Cabinet Secretary agree with me that pupil-led peer education is to be encouraged and that head teacher leadership can make the difference to ensuring a whole school approach to end, uh, ending prejudice-based bullying in schools? And will he commend the work of St John Ogilvy High School Thank head you. teacher, Eddie Morrison, and wish him well in his well-earned <laughs> retirement? Thank you. Well, look, look, uh, I had the pleasure of wishing Mr Morrison uh, all good wishes when I uh, visited St John Ogilvy High School uh, last Wednesday. And I, I did take a great deal of heart out of witnessing the young people leading the process of formulating the school's anti-bullying policy. It was a very engaged, sometimes very forthright conversation that was going on involving a lot of pupils. And it was well shepherded and steered by some of the uh, senior pupils within the school. So I think it's an example of pupil engagement and the expression of pupil voice, which lies at the heart of Curriculum for Excellence. It was a very good example, and I, I saw similar work the, the week before at Holy Cross High School in Hamilton, uh, which demonstrated a similar uh, approach to engaging young people in the formulation of effective anti-bullying policies. Question 9, Daniel Johnson. To ask the Scottish Government what progress it is making delivering the expansion of early learning and childcare. Minister. The Scottish Government is on track to deliver our ambitious programme to almost double funded early learning and childcare entitlement to 1140 hours by August 2020. We are committed to fully funding the expansion and reached a landmark agreement with COSLA leaders on the 27th of April on multi-year revenue and capital package. This agreement will see the annual revenue investment increase by 567 million on 2016-17 levels by 2021-22, while 467 million of capital funding will be provided over four years. This real partnership working is further evidenced by our joint consultation with COSLA launched on the 29th of March 
uh, which set out the details of the national standard that will underpin the new funding follows the child model that will be introduced in 2020 and that's still open till the end of this month. We're also working with our partners to support the expansion of early years workforce. In October 2017, we launched the first phase of our recruitment marketing campaign targeted at school leavers with the second phase to attract career changers and parental returners to ELC launching just last month. Daniel Johns. I thank the Minister for that response. Um, she'll be no doubt aware of the recent NDNA survey which points to four out of five independent and voluntary sector nurseries saying that the, the money they receive for the current uh, funded places is too low. £3.72 per hour per child is what they say they get which is no surprise when you consider the living wage, staff ratios, that they say that they are £2 an hour per child short. Does the Minister recognise that figure? And if so, how is she going to tackle it? Because if she does not, I fear the 11.40 hour will either not be met, net met or do real damage to the small and independently managed Minister. nurseries which are so important Minister. to this provision. We're going to introduce a new funding follows the child model in 2020 and a key aspect of this model is that all providers delivering the funded early learning and childcare entitlement will receive a sustainable funding rate set at a local level that reflects the cost of delivering in a setting and allows for the delivery of national priorities including the payment of a real living wage. As I said yesterday, we've introduced a new 100% um, rate relief for private properties, wholly or mainly used as day nurseries, which has been really welcomed by the sector. That relief will remove the burden of rates from up to an estimated 500 businesses to support an inclusive workforce whilst benefiting the economy as a whole. We have and we continue to engage with providers on the development of this um, incredible expansion, which um, I would have to say we've been engaging with providers multiple times. As I have said, yesterday at the ELC Strategic Forum, I received um, a commitment from my COSLA colleagues who we've been working so closely in partnership with that both of us would absolutely commit to tackling any individual difficulties that people are encountering that sectors are encountering with individual local authorities. We have a really solid working agreement at the moment, really solid partnership, shared vision, shared commitment, and we are willing to help the sector to um, solve any problems that they might be facing at the moment. It's essential to our delivery of this programme, absolutely essential to the delivery of this programme that these nurseries and childminders um, receive the payment that they require. Thank you, Joan McAlpine. Thank you. Uh, can the Minister outline what impact she expects the deposit guarantee trial to have on Dumfries and Galloway and how the government will evaluate it? Minister. Um, for participating families in Edinburgh, Glasgow, Dumfries and Galloway, the deposit guarantee pilot will guarantee their deposit, meaning that up to 44% of families with children under three won't have to pay a deposit up front. And our recent parent survey found that families can experience difficulties paying the upfront costs. Um, associated with nurseries, including deposits. Some of the nurseries have told us that the deposit guarantee scheme will help them to change their pricing model. And if, if nurseries are able to um, use the deposit guarantee, they'll no longer have to charge fees in advance, which obviously for families can be a real struggle and a barrier to returning to the labour market. So they've said they'll be able to charge fees in arrears, which means that the families will re have received their first paycheck before they have to pay their childcare costs and we're working with NHS Health Scotland to ensure that the pilot's fully evaluated and that will include um, understanding exactly how families and providers use the scheme and the impact that it had. Uh, thank you. If I have shorter answers and short supplementaries, we'll perhaps get a move on. Ten. Question 10, Kezia Dugdale. To ask the Scottish Government what its response is to findings of the report by NSPCC Scotland, the right to recover. Minister. Child-centred and trauma-informed health care is absolutely at the heart of current paediatric services provided to children in Scotland who experience sexual assault. The Scottish Government's Child Protection Improvement Programme is taking forward work to ensure, negative, ensure effective protection is in place for all children at risk from abuse and neglect. 
We've established a task force for improving services for adults and children who've experienced rape and sexual assault, which is led by the Chief Medical Officer. And in addition, we've also established an expert group for preventing sexual offending involving children and young people to identify actions to better prevent sexual crime involving children and young people. In May last year, the Scottish Government and NHS Education Scotland published a national trauma skills and knowledge framework to support strategic planning and delivery for training of all of those who have contact with people affected by trauma across parts of the Scottish workforce. Kezia Dugdale. Minister, the report says very clearly that there's a lack of services for children following sexual abuse in most local authorities across Scotland. And where it does exist, it's patchy, inadequate and unable to meet demand. So what exactly is the Minister doing to ensure that the resources she has matches the rhetoric she's just used? Minister. Getting it right for child victims is absolutely a priority in our ongoing reform of our justice system. And I can assure you that we're working across portfolio with our health colleagues and with our justice colleagues. And we've made significant process in recent um, months in improving the support for child victims. I know that it's been an issue in this chamber in my own constituency, constituency, the distances that people have to travel from Orkney and Shetland. And there's been great strides forward in improving that. Um, the Vulnerable Witnesses Criminal Evidence Bill has just been introduced into the Scottish Parliament and delivers the commitment that we made in the programme for government. And that bill, amongst other things, creates a new rule that the children who are due to give evidence in the most serious solemn cases should have their evidence pre-recorded in advance of trial. And that's a really important step towards achieving the Scottish Government's vision that where possible, child witnesses should not have to give evidence at trial. Thank you. Question 11, Kenneth Gibson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government which Scottish colleges carry a PFI burden and what it is doing to alleviate this. Minister. Kilwinning campus of Ayrshire College is the only Scottish college with a PFI arrangement in place. PFI contract obligations of around 2.2 million per year on the campus at Kilwinning continue until 2025. Kenneth Gibson. I thank the Minister for that answer. The previous Labour Lib Deb administration saddled the then James Watt College with a £50 million PFI burden following a £7 million investment in Kilwinning, which Ayrshire College subsequently inherited following regionalisation. Does the Minister agree it is unfair that Ayrshire College, uniquely among Scottish colleges, must make annual PFI payments of £2.18 million, and that such a burden makes it increasingly difficult for the College to continue delivering outstanding outcomes for its students, many of whom are from challenging backgrounds? Minister. Well, can I begin by commending um, Ayrshire College for the outstanding outcomes that they do have for their students. And I had the pleasure of attending an event in there to encourage um, women to go into STEM careers on Monday evening. And we'd like to thank Ayrshire College for the hospitality that night. The Deputy First Minister has written to the college to confirm the proceeds of the college disposing of its former Kilmarnock campus with expected net proceeds of around £1.2 million can be retained by the college to be used towards the PFI costs on a one-year basis only. The Funding Council will continue to work closely with the college to ensure it takes appropriate steps to ensure financially sustainable position going forward. Question 12, Linda Fabiani. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government what its position is on the Young Women Lead report on sexual harassment in schools. Cabinet Secretary. Officer, we want every child and young person in Scotland to develop mutually respectful, responsible and confident relationships. No pupil should feel unsafe, threatened or harassed at school. That is why we welcome the work of the Young Women Lead Committee in investigating this issue and highlighting the unacceptable issues that many young people are facing. Linda Fabiani. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. May I first of all thank the Scottish Government for the positive way that they engaged in that project. And can I also ask that the Cabinet Secretary look very carefully at the findings of the report of the Young Women Lead Committee, some of which were shocking, and uh, recognise that we still have a big issue about sexual harassment in schools, which has been exacerbated by the use of social media, and respond in full to that report. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, I acknowledge the significance and seriousness of the issues that Linda Fabiani raises, and I recognise that these issues need to be uh, pursued on a, a consistent basis. There are a number of areas where our policy is developing in this area, particularly around about the importance of healthy relationships, around the question of consent, about the ensuring that the um, personal and social education in schools is fit for the current period in which we are living, 
not to, in which we are living, not to mention the advent of social media. So all of these issues are relevant to the agenda that is raised so powerfully by the Young Women Lead Committee. And I give Linda Fabiani and the committee the assurance that the government will engage seriously on the contents of their report. Question 13, Brian Whittle. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what it's doing to ensure that school meals are of the highest quality and that the uptake of these are maximised. Cabinet Secretary. President Officer, uh, school meals are healthier and more popular than they have been ever before. Um, we, uh, we have now seen an uptake of over 50 million school meals served uh, each year. Uh, last week, I launched a consultation on recommendations to further improve the school food regulations at the new Broomlands Primary School in Kelso. This is an excellent example of a school working to promote healthy eating habits in pupils. Brian Whittle. Uh, can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer? Of course, the recent report uh, we would, would argue against the, the quality of school meals currently in the school. And, and in his consultation, can I, can, I, can I help him by saying what we're looking to do here is procure food locally, prepare it on site, mm -hmm. and then allow pupils uh, input into the menu to apply that learning. I mean, when will we stop having these consultations on consultations and actually implement the obvious? Because looking at the children eating more... No, I have to have it briefly to other members then. Thank, Thank you. you. Cabinet Secretary. Well, I think, first of all, um, the, the government has had in place regulations about school meals um, and their standards, nutritional standards, since 2008. And there's, stat there's, there's, there's a statutory footing to that guidance, so we expect that to be followed in individual circumstances. Secondly, I think it is desirable for food to be prepared on site. And the example I cited of Broomlands Primary School, the food was being prepared there that day by members of staff and being presented uh, very uh, positively to young people. And the consultation that I have just launched, thirdly, um, is not about reviewing fundamentally the standards because the standards um, are judged by the group who have just uh, undertaken the technical work on my behalf to be of the highest level, they are applying some further changes in relation to the reduction of sugar intake to ensure that there is a greater presence of fruit and vegetables within the, um, the menus that are available to young people. And finally, um, Mr Whittle's point about the engagement and the involvement of young people, I would heartily encourage that. I think it's one, one of the many ways in which young people must have their voice heard within our education system. So it, it, any school, I think, would be serving its pupils very well by engaging pupils in discussions about the quality of school meals and their aspirations for the type of food they want to consume. Question 14, James Kelly. To ask the Scottish Government what its position is in a number of uh, pupils from disadvantaged backgrounds applying to university. Minister. We are committed to ensuring that all of our young people, no matter their background, have an equal chance of going to university. Our target is for 20% of students entering university to be from Scotland's 20% most of five backgrounds by 2030. The 2017 UCAS stats um, on entrance demonstrate that we are making good progress towards this goal, with a 13% increase in the number of Scots from the most deprived communities getting a place to study at Scottish universities. That means 605 additional people from the most deprived communities being accepted to study. Through the Access Delivery Group, we will continue to work with universities to push forward our fair access agenda. Must be a brief supplementary. So, despite the government rhetoric, recent UCAS stats so show that applicants from disadvantaged backgrounds are, are percentages declining, whereas those from advantaged backgrounds is increasing. Uh, what, uh, this is a worrying trend, what specific action is the government taking to reverse the trend and give pupils in all areas of Scotland uh, equal access to university? Minister. As I referred to in my original answer, the latest stats from UCAS do demonstrate um, progress on the widening access um, agenda. The Funding Council's report on widening access produced figures for 2016-17, which are baseline figures which reference applications to university before the Commission of Widening Access report um, became into place. Uh, the government is obviously carrying out the recommendations of that report and we expect to see further progress in future years. We started late, so I'll take question 15 briefly. Ross Greer. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government what action it's taking to address the reported low uptake of coordinated support plans for children with additional support. Cabinet Secretary. 
President Officer, under the Additional Support for Learning Act, education authorities have a statutory duty to consider whether children or young people for whom they are responsible require a coordinated support plan. The purpose of the CSP is to enable support to be planned in a coordinated way to meet the needs of pupils who have complex or multiple needs which require significant support from education and other, any other agency. To support authorities in these considerations, in December 2017, we published the revised Supporting Learners Code of Practice, which includes guidance for authorities on meeting their duties under the Act in relation to CSPs. Both question and answer must be short, please. Thank you. Does the Cabinet Secretary accept that there is a direct link between the loss of hundreds of specialist additional support needs teachers and the exceptionally low uptake of coordinated support plans for young people with additional support needs? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, no, I don't accept that relationship because there's a statutory duty on local authorities to ensure that any child whose needs require a coordinated support plan must ensure that they receive a coordinated support plan. So the, the two processes are entirely separate. There is a statutory duty and obligation on local authorities to ensure that they fulfil what's expected of them under the Additional Support for Learning Act. And members of the public, young people and their families have a right to expect that from local authorities. Thank you and I apologise to the five members I was unable to take. I'm going to move straight on in a few moments to the next item of business as that concludes portfolio questions.